You're listening to Dairy Voice by Dairy Business News, a podcast exclusively for the dairy industry. One of our sponsors of the Dairy Voice podcast is National DHIA. NDHIA ensures information accuracy and represents their members' interests. They are the direct voice for the dairy information industry. To find out more, go to dhia.org. If you raise calves, you know you can't prevent stress, but you can give your calves the boost they need to rise above challenging conditions. Nurture Boost is a uniquely formulated feed additive that supports calf lung health and enhances overall immunity to elevate your calves' ability to withstand stress. Boost your calves for better performance at BoostYourCalves.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in your day, welcome to the Dairy Voice podcast by Dairy Business News. I'm your host, Connie Cooper, with Seal Pro Silage Barrier Films by Connor AgriScience. Thanks for joining us today. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. Check out our past episodes, too. We've covered a variety of topics and have recently had some very entertaining guests. So today's topic is oxidative stress in calves, a complicated subject that gets down to the cellular level. But at last, we're going to break it down, understand it, and what it means to the calf, and get some practical tips on how to deal with it. My guest is Dr. Tana Dennis, Ruminant Innovation Lead with Cargill Animal Nutrition. So welcome, Tana, to the Dairy Voice podcast. Let's start by having you introduce yourself and tell us how you got to this point in your career with Cargill Animal Nutrition. Thanks for the invitation, Connie. So you've already alluded to, I'm a Ruminant Innovation Lead with Cargill Animal Nutrition North America. I specifically focus on young animal nutrition, so hence why I'm here today to speak with you about calves and and stressing calves. I took an interesting journey to get to the point that I'm at in terms of focusing on innovation. I started with Cargill about nine years ago in a technical sales role right out of grad school. Um, So I was working directly with regional feed mills, independent consultants, directly with farms. So started at the, we'll call it the customer level, and then have worked up through tech support into this innovation role. So I have a pretty unique link between the science as well as the customer and the applied side of that innovation circle. It's been an interesting journey, and, and hopefully I and bringing a lot of value to our customers through the work that I'm doing. Oh, I'm sure you are. Then that's so important to have that practical background before you step into a role that you've got like this. That's great. Where'd you go to school? I I went to school. I went to graduate school at Purdue University. Uh, I studied ruminant nutrition with an emphasis on management and mostly focusing on the replacement heifer. I did a lot of my work trying to understand the relationship between pre-weaning and post-weaning nutrition with emphasis on rumen development in that post-weaning phase. So pretty much everything that I worked on during graduate school was anything under nine months of age. And grad school was at Purdue as well? Yep. So undergrad was University of Florida. I grew up in the Southeast. Ah, Okay. Moved to Indiana, moved to the Midwest. Um, It was was definitely a shift, but it was a good shift. And I learned a lot when I uh, was completing my grad work at Purdue. Yeah. You're a Boilermaker. I am. Yeah. My my oldest daughter is a Boilermaker too. It was a great place to go to grad school. It was a nice little, nice little town, a lot smaller than where I was when I was in Gainesville. And it was, it was a really fulfilling experience. Right. I've heard they've got a great chocolate shop there. Yeah. Chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. It's time to look for more from your animal nutrition provider. And more is exactly what Purina delivers. When you choose Purina, you can be confident knowing you're helping your animals reach their fullest potential. Visit PurinaMills.com to figure out how you can get more from your feed company. Well, let's get started. Oxidative stress. Tell me about that. What What is that? And what does it mean to a calf? So oxidative stress is essentially when there is an imbalance of antioxidants. So think about things like vitamin E, 
selenium um, with free radicals, like uh, they call them reactive oxygen species. They're essentially, they're, they're metabolites from anything that's going to stress out the cell. So it's just, it's a, it's kind of an accounting issue. When you have too much of the free radicals, you have an imbalance that's going to push the animal towards negative health and production outcomes. If you've got a higher balance of antioxidants, you're in the red, so to speak. What does this mean for the calf and for the calf's caretaker? So there are any number of things can cause oxidative stress in an animal. So this is independent of, you know, whether or not they're a calf or a, a transition cow or even a mature cow just going through lactation. All these animals are going to experience some sort of stress. It's hard to get away from. Things that are happening in the body are going to create these free radicals. We just have to be able to balance them. Where it's unique for a calf is that the stressors are different. You know, you think about the, the first major stress event in a calf's life is being born. You know, they're going from an incubator, mm -hmm. you know, a really safe environment where they're getting all the nutrients that they need because mom is partitioning the nutrients to that calf to make sure that she's got he or she's got all that they need to be healthy when they enter the world. So first major stress event, you're going from comfort to whatever environments outside mm -hmm. could be sub freezing in Minnesota in the winter. It could be 110 degrees in California, mm -hmm. you know, two major extremes. First major stress event that's unique, not that much different from the cow because the cow is going through that transition too, mm -hmm. but the calf is only set up with what mom is able to provide that calf. Then the next thing that we have to make sure is that we get colostrum into the calf because that's going to be the first meal. So they're getting energy, amino acids, um, but that's also where they're going to get vitamin E, which I mentioned that earlier. Vitamin E is a really important antioxidant that's going to be coming from the diet. And that's how that calf's going to get really bioavailable vitamin E to start building the stores and okay? start building that savings account of antioxidants. Okay. Um, so, the, so the vitamin E is providing the antioxidants to fight these, these free radicals, correct? Correct. Okay. Yep. So vi vitamin E acts as they kind of scavenge for those free radicals oh, so that okay. they can neutralize them. Okay. Right. It's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but that's the, that's one of the main purposes of vitamin E. What does life on the cutting edge mean to alfalfa grower, Dan Sheps? Harb Extra has been very consistent on our test results from first crop through fourth crop. The higher quality has allowed us to feed less byproducts and feed more alfalfa haylage in our diet. And cows are able to have a higher intake with a higher quality forage. Hear more of Dan's story at harvextra.com. There are also specific amino acids that are playing into that oxidative stress cycle, right? So we talk a lot about it in cows where, you know, methyl donors like methionine, choline, those sorts of things, important for transition health. Methionine intake is also important for that animal to be able to start building their reserves of um, an antioxidant called glutathione. Okay, so that's the main endogenously made antioxidant in the body. And that starts getting built up in the liver, in the, that savings account. Glutathione is important. Vitamin E is important. Selenium is also important. Those are the kind of the main three nutritionally associated antioxidants that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. okay, so that we can be able to build those reserves for that animal in the event that they have a stress event, mm -hmm. okay, which could be you know, heat stress. Uh, one thing that we're seeing a lot with calves now, especially on larger dairies in the central and Western regions is they're getting transported pretty early in life. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. So that is a significant psychological as well as a physical stressor on that animal, depending on how long they're on the truck, we're trying to get them from say Wisconsin to New Mexico. That's a long trip making sure first that the nutrition is there so that they're fed before they get on the truck. That's going to give them amino acids and energy. It's also going to give them some vitamin E and other antioxidants, but making sure that they are in a positive energy balance when they get on the truck so that they are better suited to withstand the stress of travel as well as the stress of being in a new place. Because it's, especially if you're talking about wintertime, you're going from cold environment to hot environment, maybe or hot environment to hot environment if it's summer, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a significant environmental and physical stressor mm -hmm. for that animal. 
what effects can we see on these calves? What should we be looking for when, when they're under oxidative stress like this? So that's a, it's a great question because it's hard to pinpoint exact. So being able to say, yes, that calf is under oxidative stress with certainty is difficult, sure. right? You'd have to, you'd have to take blood samples to look at certain serum biomarkers. The reality is, is if it's something that is going to cause that animal to say have higher respiration rates, because that can be an indication that that animal either has one heat stress, but also if they have a fight or flight response, you know, that's a psychological stress that will cause them to respire more, which means that they're pumping more blood, Mm -hmm. which means that they are in a state where they're using more resources because they are stressed. So that would be predisposition to oxidative stress. So that's one thing to look for. The other thing is if you start seeing calves over the span of several weeks, start to look thrifty, that probably means that they're in negative energy balance, which could be tied back to are you doing multiple stressful things to that animal? So I mentioned transportation, but vaccination protocols can be stressful. They're certainly important for health. And I'm not a veterinarian and I'm not trying to act like a veterinarian, but the way that vaccines work is that they encourage inflammation to start the cascade of that animal being able to build its own acquired immunity. So Mm -hmm. making those immunoglobulins to make sure that they can have a response to whatever you're vaccinating them for. The inflammation is going to cause a little bit of oxidative stress. A little bit is okay, but when it starts running wild and you have a lot of inflammation that's uncontrolled, then you can start to see that manifest in how those calves look. They might start getting sick, right? So you might see uh, increases in scouring. Then you might see an increase in incidence of respiratory disease after a scouring event. So it just creates a cascade that's really hard to catch up on. Get your SealPro silage barrier film today. Protect the seed, fertilizer, labor, and expensive inputs that you've invested in. Choose best-in-class SealPro now in three different versions. Traditional two-roll application, our new co-rolled application, and super simple and wildly successful one-layer film, SealPro One. It's easy to buy, easy to use. Contractor covering, we'll work with them. Learn more at sealprosilage.com. That's S-E-A-L-P-R-O silage.com. Family owned and operated for over 25 years. 559-779-5961. That's 559-779-5961. It's sounding like uh, preventative is the best way to go is to make sure that you're just a, maybe to assume that oxidative stress is going to happen to make sure that doesn't get started and start that whole cascade. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. I I think uh, one of the things that we encourage our customers to do is, you know, start looking at your program holistically, like list out all Mm. of the things that you're doing to that calf in the span of eight weeks, 10 weeks. And Anytime you're doing something that could cause an inflammatory response can cause psychological stress, you know, grouping, grouping Mm -hmm. those calves. We have lots of examples of farms that may start individually feeding those animals and then they move them into a group that's going to create stress. Just essentially taking, taking stock of what you're already doing. And recognizing that, yes, these are management things I have to do. How can I minimize the stress every time that I am doing that particular management protocol? What is the impact long-term of oxidative stress on a calf? This is an area that has a lot of ongoing research, both in cows and in calves. I think we understand it a little bit better in mature animals. And I think that's mostly because we kind of have immediate responses that we can see, right? We can see drops in milk. We can see increased health incidents around transition. With calves, you know, the best indicators that we have are growth rates. If we have folks that are weighing their calves and they know what their growth rates are, which isn't everybody, but certainly those that monitor that can see that, you know, within an eight-week period, which is a lot longer than milk response. You can see it with trends in health issues. So the long-term implications though, anytime a calf is sick, which is likely going to be either the result of oxidative stress or it's going to cause additional oxidative stress, Mm -hmm. um, 
there are long-term impacts on productive potential in those animals. There's lots of examples of meta-analyses where they have taken a whole bunch of different data sets. They've condensed everything down to try to understand over however many studies have been performed, what is the, what's the response to doing X, Y, or Z. When a calf is sick, pretty much for every day that a calf either has scours or respiratory disease, they're going to experience a projected drop in milk production. It's usually about, it's going to be between 150 and 200 pounds in the first lactation, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start extrapolating that over a large number of animals, sure, right? there's a significant you know, cash flow issue mm-hmm. associated with that. More immediate, but still kind of long-term impacts are culling rates. And a lot of dairy producers are experiencing this right now. They've got really high value male calves and they've got really high value replacement animals. Mm -hmm. So the cost of replacing that heifer is really high Mm -hmm. and that's going to have a significant impact on their balance sheets. So it's going to hit the pocketbook somewhere. It's just whether or not it's in the first 12 to 24 months, or as soon as that cow calves in for the first time. Are there any genetic differences in calves that some will handle this oxidative stress better than others, or are we not there yet? It's a good question. It's probably a better question for the genetics companies. (laughs) If we kind of break it down, anything that is going to impact how that animal expresses the genetics they currently have potentially has you know long term implications on that subsequent calving for that animal so it, it, there's going to be some sort of change potentially especially if it's going to happen within the first couple of weeks calves are fairly i'll call it flexible or plastic mm-hmm. in the first couple of weeks we know we know that colostrum intake impacts how the gut develops and colostrum is going to be providing antioxidants in in addition to some other things. There's probably some nutritional programming in the first couple of weeks, you know, so making sure that they have the right amino acid intakes, the right energy intakes to make sure that they can meet their genetic potential. But beyond that, I I think we're still learning what the long-term epigenetic impacts of things like oxidative stress are. We can point probably more towards the cow research So looking at implications of feeding things like methionine, choline, methyl donors in that, um, in the dry period and in that transition period, because that's going to have a direct impact on that calf when she is in utero. Okay. So it's maybe more of a play on what we're doing to the cow, setting that calf up to be a certain genetic profile, to be more, not immune compromised, but immune strength, just more, yeah, immune strengthened, more resilient. Right. Sure. As an animal. What is one thing that a farmer could do today to increase the resilience of a calf against stress? What would you recommend if they could do one thing? Only one thing. I know know there's a lot. (laughs) I mean, we just (laughs) talked about transition cows and dry cows and calves and, you know, the stressors that they have. It's a very complicated question, but yeah, one, one thing. So I think and it's going to sound super simple, but it you would be surprised at how often tech and innovation folks in the nutrition business get asked this is colostrum. You have to have colostrum right because that is the first thing going into that calf that is going to provide energy, amino acids, and antioxidants, among other things to help mature the gut, establish passive immune transfer, and all of the things to get that calf started off on the right foot. I can't emphasize colostrum enough in terms of of what it can do. We still have a lot of room to improve. We've done a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. Sure. Um, We can see it in, you know, reductions in mortality rate around the first 48 hours. Um, we, We see it with reductions in incidence of scouring in calves. Uh, and we can see this in the USDA survey that, that comes out every seven years. Um, but we've gotten to a point where we're kind of flatlined in, in terms of mor- morbidity associated with gut issues. So essentially scours. Most of that can get tied back to the c- colostrum program. If you had a perfect colostrum protocol, what would that be? Trying to get that calf away from mom. to mm-hmm. Well, let mom obviously clean the calf off. 
But the sooner that we can get the calf separated from the cow to be able to ensure that we know how much colostrum is getting into that calf. Which, which is an important point because, and that's a big reason why it's important to separate those two. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some safety reasons, right? Like not all cows are positioned to be maternal, so to speak, Uh, but it's, it's safety for the cow. It's safety for the calf. Mm -hmm. And it's also to ensure that we are getting this really important, essentially liquid gold Mm -hmm. into this Mm -hmm. calf. And we know how much we're giving the calf. A lot of changes in, in recommendations have occurred over the last five years or so in terms of, you know, how much should we be giving that calf? making sure the calf is breathing healthy, cleaned off, separated from the cow, and then ensuring that we're getting at least 300 grams of globulin protein into that calf, which is double what the recommendation used to be, which for, I think for some farms, they might struggle trying to get that much into the calf, but we're trying to get at least 300 grams in, in the first 12 hours. So that can be split up if it needs to be, but if you can get 300 grams, which would be the equivalent of feeding about four quarts of 24% bricks, getting that into the calf, and then if possible, get a second feeding in because there's still value in kind of that that second and third milking from the cow after the first colostrum because there's still IgG there. There's still peptide hormones that are important, like things like lactoferrin. If anybody's heard of lactoferrin, that's going to help with gut health. IGF-1 helps with gut maturation. So making sure that we are setting that calves intestine up to be resilient and making sure we're getting that passive transfer of immunity. Anything that we can do to protect that calf, we should be doing. Mm -hmm. So four quarts, 300 grams of IgG. Then if you can do an additional two to three quarts, second feeding, to me, that's that's the minimum that we should be doing. Mm One of the things that I have, you know, talked about with our, our calf consultants is just, yeah, you know, how much how much do we actually do to calves? And we just sat down and made a list of everything that potentially could cause stress or oxidative stress to a calf, and it's a lot. I, I talked during the call about transportation and heat stress, but. I mentioned vaccines, but we we've got grouping, we've got changes in that act like antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So I talked about how, you know, vitamin E can help neutralize free radicals. Well, there are other plant molecules that kind of serve a similar purpose. They're not identical to vitamin E, but they can act like vitamin E and spare vitamin E for other things, neutralize those free radicals and make sure that that calf is addressing any type of oxidative stress mm-hmm. through the diet. Mm-hmm. So, so these are, these are products that are set up to either go in milk or it can go in dry feed because we've got stress points really early mm-hmm. and it's a lot easier to put something in milk mm-hmm. to make sure that it gets into that calf. Or if we've got a, a weaning or a post weaning stressor and those calves are eating you know, either only dry feed or they're eating enough dry feed for it to be effective. You've got a dry feed application too. So Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot, there's a lot of tools on the market. Cargill has one of them. You know, you talked about dry feeding. So what's your recommendation as far as when to start that starter, that grain starter? It really depends on how a farm is feeding milk. OK, because because it, it really comes down to an accumulation of the industry standard or the industry recommendation is about two to three pounds per day for three days before you can wean them. Dairy Calf and Heifer Association has upped that recommendation to four to five pounds mm. per day. The reality is you have to have enough exposure of the rumen to starches, sugars, a lesser extent fiber, essentially the fermentation end products to chemically mature the rumen. You can easily get two to three pounds or four to five pounds of intake if you wean a calf cold turkey. You don't necessarily have the accumulation of that ahead of time to make sure that that calf is prepared. Mm -hmm. So that's a circular way of getting to it's complicated Mm -hmm. and what it should be. It's, It's very much dependent on what a farm is currently doing. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that our calf specialists are really good at is that consultation 
around, okay, what are you doing? What are your goals? Where do you want to be? And then trying to create something that fits in their little box to be able to make sure that we've got good starter intake before weaning so that we can have a smooth weaning transition. Something else we really didn't talk about much earlier was environment, the tools, the buckets, the bottles, the hutches or the pens or whatever they're being held in. Um, What can you tell us about that? One of those other stressors is pathogen, pathogens, environmental pathogens. So hygiene, whether it's feed equipment, housing, is really important for not taxing the system to a point where that calf can get sick. Because if you've got steady flow of you know, E. coli, salmonella, rotavirus, crypto coming in because you might not be getting feeding equipment as clean as you need to be. That is going to tax the immune system from the get-go, right? And that is going to use energy. It could be partially inflammation too. You know, so if you've got an infection, a gut infection, there's probably some local inflammation inflammation taxes the immune system can also cause oxidative stress. What you end up doing is you you lower kind of the maximum uh, performance potential of that animal if you've got low amounts of pathogens coming in from dirty feeding equipment. Housing, same thing. You know, if, if you're not scrubbing debris off of hutches, off the inside of hutches between calves, if you haven't moved your touch pad in 20 years, right, <laughs> you got to right. build up of, of stuff in the soil and, and bedding can only go so far and kind of blocking that. So just being cognizant, obviously within your system, what you can manage and try to manage it the, to the best of your ability. Cause mm-hmm. you know, real estate can be hard to, you know, move hutch pads around, for example, but power washing a hutch, letting it sit in the sun and completely dry if you can manage it, that's what you what you should be doing because you're at least debriding all of that organic material off. You're letting sunshine do its sanitation thing and um, reducing that pathogen load for the next calf that's going to be going into that hutch. Right. And I would think ventilation in calf barns kind of falls in line with that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you've got circulating pathogens uh, because you have a lot of turbulence in the air and you're not getting fresh air in enough and getting dirty air out. It's why there's a tendency for respiratory disease in barns, especially in the wintertime or at least in the transition weather period. So fall and spring uh, when you've got variable temperatures inside and outside the barn and you can't quite get it ventilated correctly for the environment overcrowding too. Uh, I think a lot of barns get pushed in terms of stocking rate, not just on the cow side, but also on the calf side. You know, if you're trying to put more calves in than the barn was engineered to handle from a ventilation perspective, you can create a lot of um, train wrecks yeah. in terms of, of lung health. And, you know, I, addre- I address the, the long-term implications of health issues, respiratory diseases kind of, it, it's the second leading cause of death in weaned animals, but it has longer term implications mm-hmm. in terms of whether or not that animal is productive. Yes, scouring is, it's a huge issue. It can result in high mortality rates, but with lungs, if if that heifer is set up with bad lungs going into her first lactation, she's probably not going to last long. And you've got the investment of, you know, 22 to 24 months of feed you know, there's a fetus there, she calves in, her genetics are going on, but maybe she's not because her lungs just can't keep up with that cow is being asked to do in lactation. Thank you, Tana, for all this information today. If our listeners want to know more, is there a website that they can go to? Sure. So if you want some general information and the ability to kind of ask a question, contact somebody at at Cargill, you can visit putyourherdfirst.com. You're also always welcome to get in touch with your Cargill calf consultant or or sales representative and learn a little bit more about how we would approach managing stress on your operation. Putyourherdfirst.com. Yes. Well, we've been talking today to Tana Dennis who is the Ruminant Innovation Lead at Cargill Animal Nutrition. 
I'm Connie Cooper with Seal Pro Silage Barrier Film by Connor AgriScience. You've been listening to Dairy Voice by Dairy Business News. Please subscribe, like, and share this podcast. We are concerned for calves and avoiding oxidative stress, but remember to take care of yourselves as well. So thanks for listening, and we'll talk again very soon.